So One X recently announced pre-orders for their One X humanoid robot for home applications. It's a five foot six robot that's 66 pounds, but what's exactly underneath this cloth that it wears? We're gonna be diving in exactly what's inside and how it's able to do all the movements that we see. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Kevin. I've been doing robotics and AI for 10 plus years and have lots of resources on my channel. I also have a master's robotics and AI bundle as well as a robotics projects bundle that you can check out at kevinwoodrobotics.com. Okay, so starting with the hands, we see this is one of the images that was shown in their videos, but you can see here, these are gold lines here. Uh, but in the real robot, we see there are more of these black lines. So these lines, what I think is the actual cables that dry the flexion of the fingers. And you can see this one right here, I think probably terminates at this section. So you have one section that controls uh, this part of your hand. And then from this view, it looks like there's probably another cable. So this one's just a close up. You can see the cable again routing, um, but this one would control, for example, this degree of freedom would cause this flexion. And you also see another flexion here about this axis. And then you have one more that's going here that probably allows the finger to move back and forth like this. You can't quite see how it's actuated, but um, suspecting that that's also another degree of freedom. So if we look at this image, you see that there's probably a pass through. So you see two black lines here, and that would suggest that um, there's two lines that go to the two different knuckles. So if we look at this image here, it's probably another termination point that goes down here and then back down. So most likely you have one that controls the very tip and then the one that has the main knuckle here. So most of these fingers you see, we have one axis here, two, three, that's three degrees of freedom. And then the side, the side tilt from uh, this axis that you could see here. That's the same for this one. It's a little bit hard to draw because it's cluttered, but basically you have one axis here that does this rotation, giving each finger about four degrees of freedom. Uh, sometimes the thumb has some extra ones, but I'm assuming that each of these fingers probably have four. So four times four, you get 16, and then the thumb probably has at least the same and maybe an additional one. But from here, it looks like the thumb doesn't flex, so most likely this might be a simpler hand here. And you can see right here, this is the wrist design. You can see there's two axes here. You have one here and then another one in this direction. So it's a pretty standard two degree of freedom wrist. But I would say the main thing with the One X robot is that uh, they chose to be cable driven. A lot of the other ones they use like Unitree figure, they're all the wrist design tend to be uh, direct drive or some sort of motor motor configuration that doesn't use cables. So these they're, they're one of the few ones that use cable driven for the wrist design. And it does move the weight back, but I would say it does increase a lot of the complexity. So that's kind of the trade off that you get. You can see here, this is another close up too. This is the main axis here with the cables here that drives it. Um, but they probably have some additional cables that go to the palm to actually actuate it, or maybe some of the actuation might be somewhere inside the palm. There's no real disclosure on that, so um, at this point we're kind of guessing where the actuation is, but most likely they probably have it somewhere in the hand is my guess. But here you can see a close-up of the, which I think should be the wrist mechanism. So you can see one axis of rotation here, this is the main one of the main wrist pivot, and then you have another axis here that's coming out of the page. So that gives you your two degree of freedom here, and you can see some of this cable wrapping. Um, this is a crisscross. I think they're doing a crisscross here because if you were to fan out here, you would have uh, more cables as coming out. So I think they have this like crossing configuration mostly for uh, packaging the cables to be a little bit tighter in terms of how it's enclosed. But you can see that there's these idler pulleys here that redirect the direction. So that's how you're able to get the two intersecting axes to have the wrist have the two degrees of freedom of motion there. Here's another image of the robot without any clothes on. You can see here at the shoulder, there's the main actuation here that allows the arm to flex back and forth. 
And there's probably another actuator here um, that's intersecting. You can see this one right here. So it creates a two direction here. It's, it's a little bit weird how I'm drawing it because the body is tilted sideways. But basically you have the two intersecting axes there. And then we also have another one that's probably somewhere in here that allows another rotation. You have another elbow joint down here. And then I think all the cable mechanism is probably after the elbow is my guess. So right here in the bottom is the wrist, some of the wrist cable configuration that I showed previously. And here you can see we have the two eyes, which is pretty clear uh, with the clothes on. And you can see there's some additional actuation here for the waist to do some pivoting. It's a little bit hard to see here, but there's probably, um, it seems to be similar to some of the figure configuration to do the uh, tilting back and forth. So I wasn't able to find any good views of the waist, but from here you can see there's definitely at least one actuation that allows um, the torso rotation here. And then there's another actu actuator here, I think, probably also to do some of the tilting of the near the spine area. So that's probably what that one is. But looking at the next slide, you can see that this is a close up here. Uh, you can see this actuation here. Uh, there appears to be probably another one here, the circular part, and then another, another one here. Again, it's kind of cluttered in this point of view, but that's probably the actuation for the waist that we were just talking about. But let's take a look at some of the squatting motion. Uh, again, there's no real reveal of the legs, but just from the way it's sitting down, we could make some educated guess in terms of the configuration. You can see this bend here is very low relative to where the hips is. So that tells me that there's probably some actuation that's happening before the pitch. So the pitch actuation is what causes the flexion. So this flexion degree here. Normally when it's pitch first, the flexion actuation happens much higher. So um, from this configuration where I see it happening, my guess is that it's a little bit lower just based on how it's flexing. But again, it's a little bit hard to tell because we haven't seen it with the close off here, but you can see this flexion here is happening pretty low, which my guess the actuator is somewhere here. If it's pitched first, I would expect it to be somewhere a little bit higher. So that's kind of the main differences that I see from the squatting position. So you typically have different configurations like a hip roll, hip yaw, hip pitch. I think they're probably doing either a hip roll, hip yaw, and then pitch configuration, or possibly these two are swapped where you have a yaw roll and then pitch. And again, that's because of the lower pitch that it seems to be doing. The knee actuation here is pretty clear that it has some knee actuator. We don't quite know if they have a direct drive at the knee or if it's some linkages or cable driven, like some designs we've seen. And in terms of the ankle, uh, we haven't really seen much, but you can see there's definitely a pitch degree of freedom here. I'm assuming that it probably has a roll configuration just because most humanoid robots now is pretty standard to have six degrees of freedom, but up to now, we don't quite know how it's actuated. There's another image here of the robot. This is a URDF file seen in Arvis using ROS. If you're new to ROS, I have courses on my website. You can check it out, but you can see the frames here. I don't know if they're showing all the frames of the actuators, but you can see at least some of the configurations which we talked about is shown here. Uh, but just based on this ankle part, if you look down here, it, it does seem like it does support a roll and pitch here, just based on how it looks. And you can see that some of these frames here is not directly at the knee, which might suggest that there could be some actuator that's um, not a direct drive at the knee. So again, we don't know what these frames are or if some of the frames are hidden here, but at least you can kind of see some of the configurations. So found this video helpful, give a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.